The broadcast of the regularly scheduled Public Health and Safety Committee will now begin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Health and Safety Committee for August 26, 2021. My name is Philippe Cunningham, and I am chair of this committee. As we begin, I will note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by members of the Minneapolis City Council and city staff as authorized under Minnesota statutes section 13D.021 due to the declared public, local public health emergency. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the open Minnesota Open Meeting Law. At this time, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Councilmember Gordon. Councilmember Gordon. Councilmember Ellison. Present. Councilmember Cano. Here. Councilmember Palmasano. Present. Vice Chair Fletcher. Here. Councilmember Gordon. And Chair Cunningham. Present. Gordon there has. Oh, so there are six members present. Thank you. Please let the record reflect that we have a quorum and can conduct the business of this committee. Everyone, we have six items on our agenda for today. Um, there are four consent agendas, uh, consent items on our agenda and two discussion items. So we will first begin with our consent agenda. So item number one is authorizing the Minneapolis Police Department to enter into a memorandum of understanding with Matt Bostrom for research, development, and implementation of shared community values for policing and officers. And item number two, or 1.2, is um, accepting a donation from the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce uh, for, the, for the services related to this values-based initiative uh, that will be uh, valued around uh, $250,000. Item number two is authorizing a grant application to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in the amount of $2 million for a 3.5 year period from January 1st, 2022 uh, through June 30th, 2025 uh, to correct housing based health hazards in Minneapolis residential units for income qualified property hazards. Item number three is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health to support maternal and child health. That amount is $847,965. Item number four and item number four is authorizing a contract with Stevens Square Community Organization in the amount of $15,000 to provide administrative support and oversight um, of the, uh, excuse me, uh, for the work related to shared resources and collaborations fund through the Neighborhoods 2020 to work with them with the oversight of um, the Stephen Squares Community Organization and Phillips West Neighborhood Organization, as well as authorizing um, a second contract with Lindale Neighborhood Association for the same amount uh, to provide shared resource staff member with the Kingfield neighborhood. With that, I will move approval of items one through four um, and see if there is any discussion. Councilmember Allison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to pull item one for discussion. All right, so I will amend my motion um, and move items two through two, three, and four for approval. Are there any discussion on those items? All right, seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call the roll on items one, I'm sorry, two, three, and four. Council Member Gordon? Aye. Council Member Ellison? Aye. Council Member Cano? Aye. Council Member Palmasano? Aye. Vice Chair Fletcher? Aye. And Chair Cunningham? Aye. There are six eyes. 
Thank you. And those items are approved. So council member Allison has pulled item number one, which is a gift acceptance from the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce for services from Matt Ostrom related to a values based initiatives project um, with the Minneapolis Police Department. Council member Allison, did you want to speak further to this item? Yes, um, first I just want to uh, say that I appreciate this item coming forward. It seems like work that's really needed. Um, I did have some questions about where this work is being housed. Um, and I also thought it could maybe, given that I myself didn't have a briefing on this item, um, thought it could be good for us to get a, a short recap of this item, uh, if there are any staff to here to speak on it. Um, uh, my questions are pretty limited. I, I think I myself understand the item pretty well. Um, and am I reading it correctly that there's not gonna actually be any money exchanged between MPD and, and the Chamber of Commerce? It seemed to be, the value of the of the of the services. Um, am I reading that correctly? Thank you for those questions. So I see um, Deputy Chief Milia Huffman is here um, to be able to speak to that, as well as Dr. Matt Bostrom, who will be leading the project from that side of the work. So uh, Deputy Chief, would you like to be able to maybe dive into some of the more logistical components and then we can maybe turn over to Dr. Bostrom to talk about the background of the project itself and what it will be. Thank you very much, Chair Cunningham and Council Member Ellison. Thank you for the questions. Um, so you are exactly correct that um, there is no uh, money changing hands um, in this project between the Chamber of Commerce and the City of Minneapolis. Uh, the Chamber has uh, stepped forward very graciously with support for this project that I have been working on since earlier this spring in discussions with uh, Dr. Bostrom um, as some really foundational work here in the city of Minneapolis. Um, over the course of my career, uh, we've had um, you know, great chiefs who had really important visions for the department um, and important professional values uh, for our officers. But one thing that we've never uh, done is to really engage with community um, and have discussions with uh, community members and other stakeholders um, to engage them about um, what values they find most important uh, for uh, the Minneapolis Police Department to be using to recruit and hire officers, and then for us to weave through all of our operations. Um, so this is a project that is not intended to uh, be an endpoint, um, but it is really foundational work in terms of meaningful community engagement to make sure that um, our officers and the work we do is really reflective of the expectations of the community um, and that we're really arriving at some consensus around what the most important values are um, as we look to recruit, particularly over the next few years where we are um, really doing some um, you know, very important work to regrow the department uh, and to really invest in the future of what public safety looks like in Minneapolis. Yeah, thank you for that. So the vote we're taking today is, is really just to, to decide who's playing, which department will sort of play a point of contact for Dr. Bostrom as he conducts this work um, alongside MPD. Yeah, so this is an MPD project working with uh, Dr. Bostrom. First phase of the project, of course, will be um, the community engagement piece of it. Uh, but then beyond that, he will be working in, a, in an ongoing way with our staff internally in the police department to really uh, look at all of our operations and make sure that we're weaving those values through everything from our recruiting materials and recruiting processes through hiring, our pre-service training, in-service training, um, evaluations and promotional processes so that internally um, all of our work streams are really reflective of what we discern from this work with community engagement. Yeah, thank you. I, I do have some not concerns about the work. I think the work is incredible. I think it's very needed and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see this us leading into this. Um, I do feel like with a lot of questions up in the air around public safety and around, um, uh, uh, you know, the police department itself. MPD is under investigation from the DOJ and the state around uh, a pattern and practice of discrimination. I feel like this could, this work, if we're just deciding where it's housed out of, um, this gift acceptance feels like it could potentially uh, start us off on a wrong foot uh, of eroding trust before we really get started. Meaning that the department that is sort of being looked at to, 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 to be helped in, in building trust with community is also going to be sort of the lead and point person with that work. Um, I feel like this work could be better housed and still uh, have everybody involved if it was to be housed out of 
the coordinator's office or civil rights, um, uh, it's not uncommon for us to uh, house work that's related to housing, for example, um, out of the coordinator's office. I know that we did that with regards to tenant protections. We did that with regards to um, uh, uh, rent stabilization as well. Um, and so I, you know, I say that um, to just say, you know, it, it feels like for the sake of trust and getting this work off on, on a good foot, um, it might be better to have a different department be that point of contact, um, but in a way that doesn't disrupt the work, but in a way that allows us to still um, uh, conduct it and, and have you as in a leadership role and, and have Dr. Boschman being able to, um, you know, proceed accordingly with the work in a smooth way. Uh, and so I'm just going to offer that. I'm not going to make a motion. I, I may make a motion before the before the, the discussion is done here, but I just wanted to offer those observations and, and say that it really feels like this work could be uh, having a different department as the point of contact uh, for this gift acceptance could be uh, could really help the work get off on a on a good foot. So I'll I'll leave it there for now, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Allison, and uh, thank you, DC Hoffman, for that additional information. Um, I will. Um, I know that Dr. Bostrom is also on the line, um, so. I have a few other council members and colleagues uh, in queue, so um, I'll go ahead and, and pause uh, with Dr. Bostrom and maybe circle back if some of the questions are answered or if anyway, we'll circle back to that. Uh, council member Fletcher followed by council member Pal Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm feeling really torn about uh, how to vote on this because on the one hand, I actually really like the content. Uh, it's a good research question. Uh, I had a chance to be briefed by uh, Dr. Bostrom and, and I, I actually think that this is something that should be on our research agenda. I think that the, uh, the, the problem that I have, and I actually did a little work to try to talk to the coordinator and, and sort of raise this in agenda setting to get to a place where we could uh, you know, bring this forward in a different way that was more coordinated with the rest of our city's research agenda. And I think this is not actually a criticism of MPD, by the way. This is a criticism uh, of the way our city is coordinating uh, our research agenda. And I think it's something that we need to work on in the coordinator's office. Um, but I, I think this is a worthy question for research. I am not sure it is more worthy than things that we have been asking for and uh, providing staff directions on and even allocating funding to that haven't been getting done. Uh, outreach and engagement that hasn't happened around a lot of the questions around public safety that the community has been raising. Uh, that's happened at a much slower pace with far fewer resources. Uh, and so I have real concerns about the Chamber of Commerce uh, being able to set our research agenda priorities for us uh, by putting money into the ones that they support. Uh, in a way that that moves something to the front of the queue. And so I, I actually do think that uh, this is something that it is research that should happen. It is research that if the council decides to support it, uh, I will support the process and I will support uh, the work getting done. I'm not sure that I can support this vote today, though, because of the way that this is coming through uh, and the way that it, I think, has a really kind of. Uh, it'll have the effect, especially with the people we're trying to like win back trust uh, for our city and our police department. Uh, and our system of public safety, uh, I think for us to start on a footing of saying, uh, so we're, we're kind of letting uh, the business community jump this to the front of the line outside of any democratic decision making process about how we should be prioritizing research um, doesn't feel great to me. And so I, I think I'm probably a no vote today in committee. Um, I think that if the council decides that we want to move this research forward, I do think it's good research. I, I, so I want to just name that I'm 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 trying to to both sort of situate my my concern about the process and my concern about uh, the the structure of the gift uh, and separate that from uh, you know from any comments on the content. I'm 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 really not not questioning that we are going to have a uh, whatever happens in in uh, uh, the public safety vote and everything else, there's going to be law enforcement. We need to be recruiting good uh, people for law enforcement uh, and creating a lot of community outreach and buy-in and trust uh, around that law enforcement function. And this is good research towards doing that work. So I want to just, you know, validate the 
the concept at the same time that I have real concerns about uh, you know the, the structure of the gift and the resources and uh, just want to acknowledge I know it's frustrating that this wasn't getting done and and I kind of uh, uh, respect uh, that uh, uh, MPD went out and found money for it because uh, I know we don't have it in the budget and and there's a lot of things we don't have in the budget but there's a lot of really worthy projects that are not getting done right now that the answer has just been no and that nobody's stepped up to fund and so I, I I'm I'm struggling to see this uh, you know jump the queue in this way I, I, I don't like the impression that that gives for the public and um, I hope that we can think about a better way to to structure and sequence and supervise research so that we're doing coordinated outreach across departments and across disciplines uh, in a way that that helps us prioritize it uh, in a in a clearer, more public way. Thank you, Councilmember Fletcher. Councilmember Palmasano, followed uh, by Councilmember Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I this isn't money being given to the city that was maybe. The title gets a little bit confusing, but my full understanding of this is that this is between Matt Bostrom and the chamber. And what we are accepting out of this is the output is the work of Dr. Bostrom um, that I think you're about to hear because Councilmember Gordon said, uh, suggested that he go first. You know, I think that for the sake of trust and establishing meaningful dialogue, it's it's important that it's the MPD conducting this effort. Um, that would be the most authentic here, not to go through some kind of intermediary, uh, whatever internal intermediary that is. This isn't, if this were the chamber giving the city money and the city deciding what to do with it, then I would absolutely agree with Council Member Fletcher that it would need to have some kind of more um, thoughtful processing as to what should really be done first. Um, but that's not what's happening here. This is exactly what our department should be doing. This is exactly what our police department should be doing and exactly how we should be doing it directly. So I am curious what Deputy Chief Huffman might have to weigh in on in terms of the importance of it being uh, a direct relationship with MPD or not, um, or I would also yield to Dr. Bostrom's thoughts on the matter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember. So I will um, uh, thank you, Councilmember Gordon, for your generosity. Um, I do want to um, pause and actually do give uh, Dr. Bostrom some space to be able to talk about what the content of this project is. Um, a lot of, I think a lot of the issues we're talking about council wise um, is around um, process, but um, I do want to talk about the content um, and create some space for that as well, because as has been mentioned, um, the content is really good. It's a, um, it's an exciting project. So uh, Dr. Bostrom, I will yield the floor to you to be able to, to give a brief, brief synopsis of, of what you're looking to do here. Thank you and welcome. Thank, thank you, uh, Council Member Cunningham, uh, Council Members, staff. Um, I, I appreciate the uh, caveat there, uh, uh, Chair, and that uh, you know how I can get going on this. But uh, one, I am I am grateful for the work uh, that uh, the City of Minneapolis is doing, and the commitment to looking at a holistic approach to improving public safety. Um, for those of you that don't know my background. I've been in law enforcement uh, for, for much of my life, uh, served uh, most recently as the Ramsey County Sheriff and then was Assistant Chief at the St. Paul Police Department prior to that. But along the way, as we're enduring today is this ongoing challenge of police officers uh, and, uh, seemingly disconnected um, in a way that they shouldn't be with our community, resulting in a lack of trust. And what I've discovered over the years is that we keep seem to be missing each other, both groups. You have community members that are desperate to trust the police. We have men and women serving us around the clock who are desperate to be trusted. And I, I, that I have a burden for that. There has to be ways for us to bring them to those sides together if we both want the same thing. And so in an effort to do that, instead of guessing what generates trust, what we've done is 
went out and talked to community members in a really deep way. It's a, it's a long story on how we go about this, but in any case, in those conversations, the community has really provided a blueprint and a framework for policing to be able to speak in languages that the speak in language that the community understands to emphasize the very values that are at the core of trust and how the community uh, understands those things and then given direction as to if the police department hires women and men that have those community-based values and exhibit those behavior traits on an individual level, trust increases in the individual officers. And as that increases, trust in the organization increases. And I think all of you know that as trust in the police or any other department increases, trust in the city increases. And so uh, what, what we've seen is, is that you'd say, well, that makes sense. That's, that's not entirely different than anyone's probably ever heard. Here's, here is the difficulty that we've seen in the 200 plus years of policing. And it's this, how do we take those values and characteristics and weave those and operationalize them throughout the department to make it part of the culture? Therein has become the challenge. And what the Minneapolis Police Department is prepared to do is to lead the way and to set an example on how to do that. And so, um, I want to just kind of clarify this in my final remarks here. This isn't my, uh, this isn't about me. I'm the messenger. Uh, my experience uh, living in St. Paul, growing up in that city, being a police officer and then sheriff there, and living alongside community members during that entire time, and then also being a police officer in that same community. I, I do add that I, I struggle and you probably can hear me stammering just a little bit, but it's emotional for me. And and I think that that I've seen this struggle and I think the community has shown us a way out. And let me just uh, to the last part is I, I am well aware of, of the importance of these things and making sure that what the Minneapolis Police Department does when it comes to community engagement, we wouldn't be doing any of this, nor would I ever recommend that we don't harvest the information that's already been done and is currently being done in the city of Minneapolis. This would not be independent. This, my purpose would be to draw in all the information that you have already collected. Let's not recreate that, let's build on it. So I'll pause there. If you have any other specific questions, I'm more than happy to answer them, but that gives you a little bit of the arc of, of where this is at. And I, I think one of the great possibilities on this is, is that, uh, the city of Minneapolis, uh, if, if this goes 50% as well as the community believes that it will, uh, you will in fact set a new model in policing. Thank you, Dr. Brostrom. Brostrom I really appreciate yeah. that um, additional context. Um, so now we will move on to Councilmember Gordon. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate that context too. It sounds like <laughs> some of the research is research you've already done but i think the proposal is to is to get more community engagement going moving forward um, and i can appreciate that it's kind of exciting uh, i also can appreciate the concerns that my colleagues have raised it feels like it's a little bit um, disjointed and not very well coordinated um, you might know or not know that um, the city council passed a resolution to commit to a year of community engagement, and we probably could have used your help at the beginning of that because it's taken the city a while to a community engagement around what do we do about public safety. Um, so there's a resolution to refer to. A lot of that work has gone on, I think, too. Um, much of it out of uh, council offices, probably um, pulling people together and having those conversations and doing that kind of engagement um, and some of it from other staff. We also have a police conduct oversight commission and they're actually um, charged with reviewing policy at, um, and working on that too. Um, and it would be, um, they are interested in community engagement and they are interested in hiring policy and then also training policy. And then what do you do in terms of somebody who might need retraining or those kinds of differences? So I can, and we also have a police conduct review group in civil rights. So I really wonder if there couldn't be some kind of um, pathway we could have here where your services could um, 
be to help us connect some of the dots and have others involved. And I don't really know where to go with this necessarily, but there's a chance that we, this could be another isolated siloed work that's mm -hmm. being done. I mean, we also have this truth and reconciliation process that we've embarked on to look at historic structural racism in our city. And the police department isn't listed as one of the departments engaging in all of that. So there has been this challenge of getting engagement in, in terms of the bigger projects and involvement. And you could be the link. Um, you could help us bridge that divide potentially. Um, I will say that your background is going to be um, create a great deal of confidence for a lot of people. Uh, and also, I will say having the chamber um, hiring you to do this for us, if that's the way we should phrase it, um, will create a lot of confidence for some folks. But it's also just going to mm -hmm. raise a lot of suspicion and concern. And there's going to be like, oh, this is a big investment to make sure that they, we don't have to change too much. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got this seasoned officer who's also been elected as sheriff who knows how to work with people and knows how to talk and and, and who already will have the confidence of the police department and 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 then big business is i don't know you're I, this isn't necessarily me talking but this is me trying to <laughs> represent voices of my constituents but um so i can appreciate um what we're saying and i Maybe there's a potential we can move it forward with recommendation and have some staff directions that would go with this or some clarity about where some partnerships would be, because um, I think um, we need to do this work um, and it's great that you've got the resources to come and help us do it. Um, and I'm also open to seeing if if um, my colleagues on the committee have any ideas about how we could move this forward. It's always nicer when things leave committee with a, a unanimous vote of support before it goes off to the council. So that's one reason I care about that. And I think not only does it feel better to have consensus, but sometimes working to get that consensus means we actually came up with something that was a better idea because we addressed concerns we hadn't been seeing at the beginning. Thank you, Councilmember Gordon. So you soft tossed a, a motion out there. So would you like to make that motion? I think I'd rather wait and see if uh, I, there's some um, Council Member Ellison uh, alluded to the fact that he might be coming forward with something after our discussion. And I see his name and the stack there. So I will um, hold that off and see if we have a better idea. All right, sounds good. I don't think I have a better idea, but I. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your excitement, Councilmember Ellison. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I, I don't have a better idea. I just wanted to, um, you know, just thank Mr. Bostrom for for coming on the call. And um, as you can probably discern from this discussion, even you know, all of these discussions lately have you know turned into these uh, proxy discussions about how much you know uh uh council members love or don't love mpd when really that's not the discussion you know the i think that what council member gordon uh mentioned which is that um uh which is the the trust issue is what i'm getting at i think this is necessary work i think i think we should proceed forward with this work but i do feel like the way it's coming forward before us today um could get us in a, in a place uh where it raises a lot of questions as council member gordon said i'll put it just more simply whenever um MPD has 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 ruptured trust with community members. One of the big criticisms, and I hear this from, uh, you know, across the board, uh, at least in my ward, is that uh, is that MPD always puts itself in charge of holding itself accountable, uh, and that that is a part of what uh, makes people lose confidence in whether or not the work is legitimate. I think your work is legitimate, but there's also uh, you know a need for us to prove that the work is legitimate and if people perceive this as just another instance of mpd only wanting to play by its own rules and not 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 coordinating with other departments um and not having any other sort of um um, um collaboration with the rest of the city enterprise i think that that could be problematic and undermine the very work that we're trying to move forward with here uh and so you know that's a part of why my my uh suggestion was to you know i again i haven't talked to the coordinator's office and and i have no idea why this wouldn't be appropriate there um so before i make that motion i'd maybe want to have some time to uh to 
have a discussion with some other departments about, you know, why, why is it essential? You know, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Councilmember Paul Masano said it's essential. It needs to be in the department. Uh, but but I, I didn't get a sense from from her comments as to as to why it's more essential there, or, you know, less essential there. I, I you know, um, so I, I think that there's a there's a need for us to make sure that the that the work is not only le legitimate, but it also appears to be legitimate. And if it's if it just a, appears to be another instance of, you know, uh, the department not wanting to collaborate with the rest of the city enterprise or putting itself in charge of holding itself accountable, that could undermine, I think, this really important work. So, um, you know, uh, so I, I'll, I'll sort of leave my comments there. I think I'm being clear. Uh, this isn't this isn't a, a, a proxy discussion for any other issue except the issue before us, which is your work, uh, Dr. Bostrom. So um, thank you very much. And 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 I'll I, again, I don't have a motion. I, I guess, you know, um, if if Council Member Gordon doesn't put anything forward, I would maybe uh, move to delay this a cycle because I, I don't want to be in a position to vote against it today. Uh, but I do feel pretty strongly that it's proceeding forward in a way um, that could could undermine the work. And so um, and so I probably wouldn't support it today um, without some changes to, to how it's coming forward. And again, as Councilmember Palmasano said, um, and as DC uh, Huffman said, uh, this, we're not discussing the exchange of, uh, you know, money being exchanged between the city and the chamber or, you know, or anywhere else. And so this, this discussion also isn't really about that. Uh, it's about, you know, where should the work live to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, to increase maximum amount of trust uh, for uh, for whatever gets produced, so 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 um, Councilmember Ellison, I'll just um, what I'm hearing you say. Um, there are you know two potential motions that can be made um, in response to the concerns, um, which would be um, motion to to delay a cycle or also to forward without recommendation. Um, so those are both two options of motions to be able to achieve what it sounds like you are hoping to be able to do so. Um, so I will um, circle out. We have uh, Councilmember Palmasano in queue. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I feel that Deputy Chief Huffman needs a chance to respond to this before I before I speak. I think she was trying to get a word in edgewise here. Could she be called on first, oh, please? I'm sorry, I did not see you. Unmute yourself, my apologies. Uh, yeah, DC Huffman, if you'd like to jump in. Thank you very much, Chair Cunningham. Uh, I just uh, did want to provide some more context for the conversation since um, uh, Chair Cunningham and Vice Chair Fletcher um, had the opportunity to um, have a much longer briefing about this uh, that the other folks on this meeting didn't have a chance to hear. Um, to know that, uh, of course, I have been working with other city departments um, in bringing this project forward. Um, I have been in discussion with Dr. Bostrom um, since February about getting this uh, work going um, and during the course of that um, have worked with the city coordinator's office um, who has been part of the meetings and discussions in an ongoing way uh, to bring this project to fruition. Um, also have uh, spoken with uh, community um, engagement manager at the Office of Violence Prevention to make sure that um, our work is parallel uh, and additive to the other city processes that are going forward. Um, and uh, both uh, former city coordinator Mark Ruff um, and the interim city coordinator Heather Johnston um, are uh, fully aware of the details of the project um, and agreed that it is appropriate for it to live in MPD. Um, and uh, we would certainly be continuing to work with the city coordinator's office on a regular basis, um, as well as coordinating our work with Office of Violence Prevention um, and our colleagues in uh, neighborhood and community relations, because we do want to leverage all of the expertise available in the city. So, of course, we wouldn't be going forward with this process um, alone and without uh, working with our other city colleagues. Um, but I do think it is critical that MPD um, works to do this community engagement um, as it is very foundational. It is an important time for us to make sure that we are doing work to know and be known uh, by community folks. Um, and as was mentioned uh, with the DOJ investigation ongoing, I know that one of the things that they will be looking at and will be expecting is um, to see our plans for doing foundational community engagement work. Um, and of course, we also have um, the really significant recruitment issues that we're addressing now and the 
court order that we're operating under requiring us to take any and all actions uh, to meet a sworn staffing level of 730 officers by the end of next June. Um, one of the things that I really like about the timing of this project is um, that it is first a discussion about recruitment um, and hopefully this kind of community engagement um, with MPD uh, will help to increase our ability to recruit folks from our community um, and will help us be able to reach that 730 number uh, by the end of next June. So thank you for the opportunity to add some additional context to the discussion. Of course, thank you. Um, Councilmember Connell, followed by Councilmember Gordon. Hang on, Mr. Chair. I am oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought you were just giving a shout out to her. My apologies, Councilmember Palmasano. Thank you. Um, I did just wanna briefly respond to Councilmember Ellison's concerns. Um, I guess the, the thing is I have spoken with the coordinator about this several times to see if there was a more logical place within um, the coordinator's office. I also have spoken second hand, but with Office of Violence Prevention, who also deeply agrees that this work needs to be taken on by the police department themselves indirectly. And so I think that, you know, we either demonstrate that this is top priority or it's not. Two cycles have gone by already since we, since this got referred to this committee. And I don't think we should wait another cycle or try to hang on to it. Let's not please delay this again. Um, we are not going to give um, this project an opportunity to do so at a really critical time. I think it's important to get going. I don't think that we can just choose to hold certain things back. Um, right now, this is work that one of the our most collaborative top female department leads in police administration has taken on as her own project. And let's please not take that away from her. Um, I would like to suggest, based on the discussion here today, that we, I, I would like to move this forward without recommendation for now, uh, in hopes that my colleagues can have some more of those conversations and get more comfortable with how this might get placed by the time of the council meeting where we would need to vote on this again. So I would like to make that as a motion that we move this forward today without recommendation. All right, thank you. Councilmember Palmasano has made a motion to move this item forward to City Council without recommendation. Um, we do have two other council members in queue. Um, I will go ahead and call on you if you want to speak to this motion. Um, so we'll go ahead and move forward. So with that, uh, Councilmember Cano followed by Councilmember Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I support that motion and um, just wanted to. Um, to share that it would be helpful if we as council members could just get information from the staff working on these projects about ways that we can participate in the projects before they come to the committee just because it feels like we're trying to do a lot of detailed uh, work at the committee level and it's nicer if there's um, a different vehicle for us to kind of plug in all of our energy and interest um, prior to sort of the um, well, I don't want to say the dress rehearsal, but you know, this is the prime time. And, and so we want to be able to integrate our thoughts and our initiatives with you as staff and as the, you know, leading consultants on this work. So in the future, if you could let us know how we might be able to either get updates on the work or um, if there's a, a subcommittee or a, a work group that that, is, that coalesces around this, um, that's typically how council members plug into um, different lines of, of work and can shape it ahead of time so that when we get to the committee um, discussion, uh, all, you know, most of the questions have been answered or, or the thoughts have been sort of processed and integrated into the work. Um, so, so today I'm happy to support the item as is or follow um, the, um, the, the motion that Councilmember Palmasano put forward. I, I feel like I, this is a good, good piece of work and that we should really advance it and um, and I, I trust that we can get most of our questions answered by the time the City Council would officially vote on this uh, at the full meeting. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chair. I will just say that this is not a full meeting. It's a real meeting. Um, <laughs> thank you for that, Councilman Bergano. I do appreciate your uh, feedback there. Uh, now we have uh, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Gordon. Thank you very much. 
Mr. Chair. Um, I, uh, I'll support this motion. I think it makes a lot of sense. I, I just want to share one of the difficult um, situations that happens for the city council um, right now, more so maybe than it did in the past when we operated slightly differently because we hadn't gotten all the clarity we needed from our city attorney's office and everywhere else. Um, we do approve gifts like this, but we actually can't direct the staff on how they will deal with a gift if it's the police department. Um, so when I'm thinking of how could I solve this problem? Oh, we could direct you to and to work with the coordinator's office and the coordinator's office to work with you and come back and report to us on progress or do something like that. But it feels like now we can only request the police department to do things because um, of the way the charter is. So that's been one challenge as I was trying to think of what could we do. Now, when it gets to the council, we could direct our the staff that you just listed because the, the partnership and the kind of the team that, that was listed um, sounded really strong and really good. And that's what we like to hear. Oh, you're actually working with all those. I would like you to reach out to the Police Conduct Oversight Commission. That's kind of the community voice with community values, and it could really be a nice connector. So, you, you know, next time you could list them and try to reach out to them if you want or the chair. But at any rate, um, I appreciate this, and maybe there'll be some opportunity for us to um, do, do something before the council meeting to help strengthen the proposal for the city council, and it, it'll be supported. But I, I don't want to see it get delayed either, and I appreciate Councilmember Palmasano making the motion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. So um, on before us is Council Member Palmasano's motion to move to forward to the full council meeting without recommendation. Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can we just get clarification? I'll, I'll support this, and I think that lets us move the conversation forward to Council uh, in a way that'll encourage us and hopefully set a deadline to get some clarity around uh, uh, a few of the questions that were raised here. One question that I did want to make sure got addressed is, has the chamber confirmed the gift? Because I got very conflicting information about that on Friday, which made me concerned about it having come through agenda setting when it wasn't it wasn't clear that that was uh, finalized. So is is this is this for sure happening? And, and do we have confirmation from uh, from the chamber that there is in fact a gift for us to be voting to accept. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Council Member Fletcher. Um, so I've been uh, working in an ongoing basis with uh, Jonathan Weinhagen at the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Um, and, uh, you know, he wants to make sure that we have uh, as strong a possible chance, of course, um, of getting approval to move forward with this work. Um, so he'll be continuing to work on the details of the funding with uh, Dr. Bostrom, uh, but they are very excited about this project moving forward. So good conversations happening, but not actually confirmed. Um, uh, so yes, la last time we met, he said yes, that he would like to see this project move forward. Yeah. OK, thank you. All right, great, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments related to this item? All right, so again, on before us now is the motion from Councilmember Palmasano to forward without recommendation. Uh, with that, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Gordon? Aye. Councilmember Ellison? Aye. Councilmember Cano? Aye. Councilmember Palmasano? Aye. Vice Chair Fletcher? Aye. And Chair Cunningham? Aye. There are six ayes. That motion carries. And that item will be forwarded to the full council without recommendation. So thank you everybody for that robust discussion. And I look forward to um, continued conversations about to be able to address some of the concerns uh, that were expressed here today. Thank you to Dr. Bostrom for joining us. Next up, we will move uh, into our discussion items. Uh, so today we will have our monthly uh, community safety update presentation and we'll, we'll then follow that with getting um, an update on the project plan surrounding um, 
some community safety research work and engagement work. Um, so we will get an update on that. Um, for our um, presentation today, um, we are going to have to switch it up a little bit here um, and actually have Josh Peterson from the Office of Violence Prevention move us forward uh, with our community safety update first. Sorry to flip it around, just got a request uh, because there is an urgent meeting that he needs to join. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, pull up that presentation for the uh, community safety update and uh, we will pass it over to Josh Peterson, manager of the Office of Violence Prevention to get us started. And then we will circle back to our uh, police department to give us uh, the update related to crime trends, statistics, and strategies. Thank you, welcome, uh, Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, if you could advance the slides, please, to the Office of Violence Prevention section, that would be wonderful. And as you're doing that, um, Director Cotton sends her apologies today. She had a conflict this afternoon. So she asked that I step in and share some brief updates with you all, um, and then also relay any questions or concerns or needs back to her. So I'm happy to do that as well. Uh, and you can actually skip to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so first, I just want to briefly give an update about our Youth Violence Prevention Week efforts. Um, I think Director Cotton shared a little bit about this last time. So each year we typically recognize Youth Violence Prevention Week as a way to raise awareness around youth violence as a public health issue. Um, and this year we recognize that in June as a way to sort of kick off a safe start to summer. And we had um, a lot of really interested folks in putting on events, so much so that we decided we wanted to do another series of events um, at the end of the summer to sort of transition us back to a safe school year. So Back in June, we had um, over 20 events, and then actually this week right now, we're hosting our second iteration of Youth Violence Prevention Week this summer. And we've got uh, 16 events happening throughout the course of this week, um, all around promoting the idea of, again, a, a healthy and safe start to the school year. Next slide, please. So this is an incredibly busy slide. I'm not going to walk through all of these events, but I just wanted to put these events out there for the record for folks who are interested. These are the remaining events we have uh, the rest of the week here, and there's a whole diverse array of things. There's basketball tournaments, there's community movie nights, there's arts activities, all sorts of great things for young people and families in the community. Um, so this slide is available for folks who want to access it, um, but I also do want to say that this information is posted on the city's website in the news section, so folks can go to minneapolismn.gov news and they'll see a little item about this. Um, there is also this information went on the city newsletter. Uh, we did send it to council members and the info is available on our Office of Violence Prevention Facebook page as well. So please, folks who are interested, um, take an opportunity to take a look at what kind of events we have the remainder of the week and come show up for our young people. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to talk uh, very briefly about some new funding we got from the um, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So I've talked a little bit at these meetings in the past about a five-year grant we had from the CDC focused on teen dating violence and youth violence prevention. That grant is ending at the end of this month, August of 2021, um, but we did apply for sort of the successor funding to that grant um, and found out recently that we were awarded that grant. So that we were one of eight um, organizations across the country who were awarded that funding. There are folks in Boston and Alaska and Georgia and California and other places around the country. Um, so we're excited to share about that. Uh, we will be bringing forward uh, the, the formal request to have to receive that money, but I wanted to share that news and just talk just very briefly about the project. Um, so this project, which is, is titled Prevail by CDC, is, is sort of building upon that previous grant opportunity and is really focused on uh, preventing violence impacting young people and particularly also around this idea of the intersections between youth violence and racism and other social determinants of health. And the work is really meant to be sort of operating at the, what we call the community and societal levels of the social ecological model. So not to get too public health nerdy here, uh, but we sort of approach our work, you know, based on this idea of what we call the social ecological model, which essentially says that in order to effectively prevent violence, we need to really work not just with individuals, but with individuals and then the relationships that they have and then the broader community surrounding them. And then also sort of societal level factors, you know, we have laws and policies and procedures and things like that. And so CDC was really interested in funding um, jurisdictions who were gonna do work at the community and the societal level of that social ecological model, 
which I think works out well for us because we have a number of, of initiatives already in the Office of Violence Prevention that do operate at that individual and relationship level. So really this work is meant to sort of complement some of the work we already have going on, I think, in a nice way. And so just very, very briefly, um, CDC sort of offered um, a couple of, you know, sort of a menu of, of potential strategies to choose from, and we landed on a couple of them. One is some work around um, supporting community members who are interested in building their capacity to be actively involved in violence prevention work. So by offering some training and resources, we hope to build sort of um, violence prevention community champions who can engage with us in this work. Um, really sort of all around that idea of promoting uh, collective efficacy and kind of you know promoting social norms that protect against violence in the community. And then the other strategy which we're excited about is working with some of our partners in the school system around sort of what it means to promote peaceful and protective community environments for young people in school environments. And so we're planning to engage some young people in really sort of working with them to help think about what those systems might look like in schools. Uh, next slide, please. So just some real brief updates about our Next Step initiative. And again, I think we've said this before, but Next Step is our partnership with Hennepin Healthcare, North Memorial and Abbott Northwestern that is focused on providing resources and supports for folks who are treated at hospitals for violent injuries. So just a couple of quick updates uh, from the past month on this. Um, earlier this month, uh, we were able to host a visit from Congresswoman Omar at North Memorial. Her office reached out really wanting to sort of just learn about Next Step, and it was a really great opportunity um, to, to sort of raise awareness about a few things. So one, you know, raise awareness about this unique partnership that we have between three different hospital systems and our City of Minneapolis Office of Violence Prevention and the state of Minnesota who provides some funding around it. So we feel that, that that partnership is a pretty unique thing. It was an opportunity to lift that up. Um, also, obviously, it was an opportunity to lift up sort of the impact that gun violence has on, on folks um, and, you know, by allowing some or by having some staff share their experiences, it was really an opportunity to sort of share what some of those firsthand, firsthand experiences with violence feel like. And then the, the third piece was it was an opportunity to raise awareness just about um, the impact that the amazing folks who work next, who work for Next Step have on a regular basis. So the Congresswoman was able to hear from staff again directly about some of the work they're doing. It was a really, really great opportunity to, to share that information and raise awareness. Um, next slide. Oh, sorry. Um, one more thing on this one. If you could go back, thank you. Um, in the um, city's uh, first round of allocation of ARP funds, there was some funding allocated for stabilization and housing supports for people who are caught up in a cycle of violence and particularly folks who are involved in some of our initiatives that deal with folks who are, again, caught in that cycle. And so we are working on sort of operationalizing that. Um, I think the first way that that's going to sort of come into, into being is in the form of some additional support around housing and stabilization for participants in our Next Step program. And so we're making progress toward um, establishing a, a, a contract to allow that to happen. We've had some good conversations with the folks at HCMC who are the administrative hub of Next Step to really figure out how we can provide that additional housing and stabilization support for those participants. Next slide, please. Uh, one more brief update I wanted to provide here is about a new federal community violence intervention collaborative. Um, so back in June, the Biden administration announced that they were gonna convene and support this community violence intervention collaborative. And they identified 15 cities that they wanted to participate in that. And these were cities who were already doing a lot of community violence intervention work and also who had uh, dedicated to use dedicated use of some of the federal ARP funds for violence prevention initiatives. So Minneapolis and St. Paul were identified by the Biden administration as sort of you know, joint participants in this effort. And the effort is really about sort of um, supporting both proven existing strategies and also new innovative strategies around community-based um, violence prevention, intervention, and infrastructure. The administration is going to be providing a connection to organizations who will provide TA to the cities. They're going to convene meetings, facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, really sort of all around this goal of how do we um, both uh, strengthen uh, the, the, the things we already have going on and also potentially bring on new things. 
And for folks who have been around this work for a while, um, there's some echoes of something we used to be a part of long ago called the National Forum on Youth Violence Prevention, which was started under the Obama administration and was really a useful tool for us to be able to connect with practitioners in local government and cities across the country doing this work. It was really invaluable for us to be able to problem solve and share. And so we're really excited about this opportunity to do something similar now. Um, we are still waiting on what a lot of the details are going to look like in terms of you know, sort of all of the nuts and bolts of it, but we're excited to be a part of this. Next slide, please. And then my last update is about our Violence Prevention Fund. So you've heard Director Cotton talk about this as well. Um, each year since 2019, we've invested in sort of community-driven solutions to community-identified um, issues related to violence. And so in earlier in 2021, we were able to award approximately $350,000 to community organizations who are doing uh, strategies that they have identified as being effective for the, the issues they're seeing around violence in community. And again, as part of the first round of the American Rescue Plan Act funding, there was additional funding allocated for another round of our Violence Prevention Fund in 2021. So we're really excited and happy to be able to fund those additional projects because when we did this the first time around in the, in the spring, we had significantly more interest in significantly more applications than we were able to fund at the time. So through this additional round this fall, uh, we plan to be able to make up to $750,000 available for these, these community-oriented violence prevention solutions. Uh, the request for proposals for that closed yesterday, so we will be doing the review process shortly. And we hope to have the awards uh, out within uh, two months or so. I believe that's the end of my slides. I'm happy to stand for questions or comments. And again, I appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Uh, very excited uh, for this update of information. Uh, very important work. Are there any questions or comments uh, related to the Office of Violence Prevention's update? All right, I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Thank you for all that you all do. Uh, and so now we will circle back and welcome Commander Jason Case and his team to be able to give us an update around uh, crime sure. statistics yeah. and uh, our responses to that. So. Welcome, Commander, and welcome to your team. Thank you so much for your patience. Sorry. Good afternoon, Chair Cunningham. Thanks uh, for having us again. Um, can we get to the, uh, is this the first slide here? Yeah, let's keep backing it up. Uh, well, we're getting that set. So um, one of our analysts, Austin Rice, is not with us today. He's on vacation. So it's going to be Scott and Lindsay um, presenting um, on the statistical analysis of crime uh, around the city. And then we will launch into a brief preliminary discussion on use of force. And Lindsay's been doing some work uh, on a, uh, an initial analysis of that. Um, and we can talk more about that specifically, obviously, at the end. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott and he can uh, Start with the violent crime. Welcome, Scott. All right, if you just want to uh, move over to the next slide. And the next one, I guess, sorry. All right, just the um, kind of the statistical analysis of uh, the year to date violent crime. Um, year to date, we have had 60 homicide victims. Um, and that's compared to the four year average of 31. So um, the one year change of that is 15%. Um, rapes continue to be decreasing um, in terms of com uh, comparing it to last year and also the four year average. Uh, robbery and aggravated assault both are up this year and are up compared to the four year average. Uh, and the subset of domestic aggravated assault, which is a, uh, from the previous category there, um, is down 14%, and that is also down compared to last year and down compared to the four year average. Uh, can you move on to the next slide? Uh, so, most of the property crime, or all the property crime, is down compared to 2020. Um, and then, just um, to kind of summarize this, uh, the two ones that I want to bring to the attention is auto theft and then also theft for motor vehicle. Those are um, down this year, but they're still higher than that for your average. So more than we've seen um, going back four years. Um, and that's a, about it for this slide. If you want to move on to the next one. And in this uh, section, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about the violent crime trends that we're seeing and then also the property crime trends. If you just want to go on to the next slide. 
And the next one. All right, uh, shooting victims. So on the left hand side, since our last meeting, um, that should say a July 27th. Um, my apologies. Um, the previous four year average was 79 gunshot wound victims, uh, both fatal and non fatal. Um, these numbers um, are for both of those categories. In 2020, we had 142 victims in that time period from July 27th to August 23rd. And uh, in so far in 2021, or for that time period, we're down about 10%. Um, and then looking on the right hand side of the chart there, the year to date total um, compared to last year, we're about 23% uh, higher. And then um, looking at that four year average, uh, that is considerably less at 216 victims. And just updated uh, the demographics that we're seeing of the shooting victims so far uh, this year as of the 23rd. 82% uh, are male and 18% are female. Uh, and then 84% are black and 10% are white, which includes Hispanic um, individuals. And then 3% are listed as unknown. And then the 2% uh, and 1% Native American and Asian respectively. Uh, the top two age groups of the gunshot wound victims that we have been seeing year to date, um, the ages of 17 to 21 are 23 percent, and then the uh, 27 to 31 are 20 percent. Um, and then the city listed in our RMS of residents is uh, roughly 60 percent um, live in Minneapolis, and then uh, 40 percent or so live in other cities. Um, and then uh, eight individuals have been shot more than one time this year. Uh, if you want to move on to the next slide. And then just is just the updated um, kind of overall graph of shooting victims by a week since 2018 and looking more recently, we've had more of a um, an up and down pattern. If you look at the last several weeks um, with a high of um, approximately 28 or so victims and then um, the last couple weeks, um, week 33, which just ended in week 32, we each had 11 victims in those uh, two weeks pr uh, previously um, and then updated uh, the year to date 2021 we're averaging about 12.7 victims per week and then you can see the um, comparative numbers for the uh, whole year of 2018 through 2020. Uh, if you want to go on to the next slide please and just more of a recent uh, a snapshot of the shot spotter activation trends um, basically since uh, week three which is January 19th through the 25th through this uh, previous uh, week 33, which is ending on August 23rd, you can kind of see just a slight upward um, trend, um, more of a seasonal trend as we're, we've um, moved from uh, winter to spring and summer. Um, and then uh, the bottom graph uh, shows the rounds detected, um, kind of mirroring uh, the activations with a couple, four notable um, increases there, week 17, week 20, week 26, and week 31. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. And this is just a updated um, year comparison or year to date comparison through the 23rd of activations round de detected. Uh, the chain percent change in activations. And also the percent change in rounds. Um, and you can kind of see the updated one through um, comparing 2021 to 2020. We're at a 35 percent increase in activations and a 30 percent increase uh, for rounds. And then also um, kind of tracking the those activations with 10 or more. Um, and I've updated that. So we are um, the activations that have had 10 or more rounds account for 6300 of the total rounds detected, which um, is from the top chart there at 17 to 75. Um, and then what we've been seeing and kind of what we've been tracking are the number of activations of the total and the number of rounds of the total percent of the total that um, have been increasing um, since 2019. We're just kind of uh, monitoring that. Um, also, there's some some weather moving in. So if you hear lightning or thunder, that's uh, what's going on. <laughs> um, you want to move on to the next slide? Uh, this is the guns recovered um, so far this year. So uh, we are at 680 guns recovered as evidence so far. And that's basically um, where we were in 2020, um, just an eight gun difference. Um, and the, ch the chart below, you can kind of see where those. 
where those guns were located um, by precinct and also out of the city. And I did uh, do, it's not shown on the slides, but I did do a comparison of last year at this time to see if um, the change was noticeable in um, one precinct to another. And the biggest change um, uh, has um, been in the fourth and fifth precinct, which um, in the fourth precinct, there's 45 less guns recovered uh, in 2021 than in 2020, but conversely, um, almost the same 41 guns increased um, in terms of collecting them for evidence in the fifth precinct. And then so overall, um, the net change is uh, just eight guns different, like I had said. Um, move on to the next slide, please. OK, so uh, moving on to robbery, uh, the the kind of snapshot since the last time we gave a presentation, there have been 30 carjackings, uh, only four business robberies, which is a good thing. And then if you um, slide over to the percent change, um, we've actually got a decrease in business robberies compared to last year, which is good to hear. Um, and then overall robberies, uh, including robbery business and carjacking um, and aggravated robbery, there have been 155. And so um, as shown on the previous slide with the statistics, that's 11% increase over last year. Um, just some general trends of what we're seeing um, in terms of carjackings. 85% uh, of the 30 have been reported in the third, fourth, and fifth precincts. Um, the third precinct had 12 incidents of those, and those were mainly located in the East Phillips neighborhood. Uh, P4 had eight incidents, and those are kind of centered around the uh, West Fremont, or I'm sorry, west of Fremont Avenue and from Broadway to Lowry. And then lastly, a cl cluster straddling the um, Interstate 35W corridor in the third and fifth precinct. Uh, trends about robbery of person and aggravated robbery. Um, we've noticed an increase of robberies in the warehouse district, especially during peak bar hours. And two areas uh, of increased concentrations in um, the fifth precinct in Stephen Square area and the Whittier neighborhoods. Um, again, the common losses are phones and wallets and purses and then the associated contents of um, the wallet and purse. Uh, if you want to move on to the next slide. Uh, and this is just kind of a trend line, uh, um, as you kind of like for the shooting victims. Uh, I did add um, the average number of robberies um, like I did for the shooting victims. So uh, in 2021 year to date, we're average, averaging 35 robberies per week. And then in 2020, that was actually the same, which is, and then looking back uh, 23 and 25 respectively for 2018 and 2019. Um, and that should be noted those those three years are for the entire year. Uh, and then um, as you can kind of see too, there, like the shooting of victims, there's a, um, in certain weeks, there's a different a wide range of up to 50 or more robberies. And then conversely, um, the following week or soon after it drops below 20. So just to kind of note that. And then uh, I think that's it. If you want to move on to the next slide. I'll just jump in right quick here because um, oh, sure. Fletcher has a question or comment. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to check in on, I know you mentioned uh, an increase in the warehouse district. How does that compare to uh, like 19 and 18? Because I, I know that there's going to be some amount of noise in the data correcting for when all the bars were closed last summer. Obviously, there were just fewer people. That means uh, fewer people committing crimes, fewer victims available uh, for people who are looking for targets. Uh, and as things open up, you would expect some of the crime that got pushed out to other neighborhoods to reorient back to the to the bar area. So how much is this uh, uh, almost like return to previous years or is it actually a spike above and beyond that? Or just give a little context if you're if you're able to uh, about the warehouse district specifically. Yeah, actually, I would have to get back to you on that one. I don't have those in front of me and I don't want to speak um, incorrectly, but I can definitely look back um, in 2018. I can go back 2018, 2019 from January through um, July or August 23rd and do a comparison of what we're what we're seeing and, and actually where to if it's in that same general area or if it's in different areas or what we're seeing compared to now. And I can bring that back up uh, at the next meeting if that's OK. Sure, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. OK, fine. moving on to the property crime segment. Uh, so we're looking at burglaries. Um, 
the burglary of dwelling and burglary of business are both down. Um, namely, the uh, burglary of business is down 52.9% uh, for the year. And then uh, I just want to um, touch on one of the trends that we're seeing, and it's actually the bottom uh, bullet point there. Burglary of dwellings are continuing their decrease, but we're experiencing different trends in 2021, um, such as occupied home burglary, burglaries uh, via unlocked windows or uh, theft of vehicles um, from burglaries where the, the burglar may have taken the keys from inside the house, gone outside and um, stolen the vehicle or, um, or from the street or wherever it happened to be parked. Uh, and those are up 80% over the last two years. Uh, and then uh, kind of touching on that, the vehicle stolen and burglaries, that's also the last um, row there on the chart. And, the, and that is up 2.4% over last year. And in 2019, there was a, um, from 2019 to 2020, there was a sizable jump there as well. So just something we're tracking. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, theft for motor vehicles, uh, continuing uh, the increase of catalytic converter thefts, um, a 22% increase over last year. Um, also increasing that we're um, tracking are the theft of license plates from vehicles parked on the street or other where. Uh, and those are up almost 70%. Um, theft from vehicle, a good uh, um, subset of larceny is down 20%, uh, which is great. Um, Theft of vehicle, I'm sorry, theft of firearms from vehicles is up uh, 35% uh, over 2020, and that's something we're also tracking. Um, still, the common makes and models uh, that are being targeted are Toyota Priuses, Honda CRVs, and Honda Elements. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, just to touch on auto theft, um, as I had mentioned, it's down um, compared to 2020, but over that four year average, it's up considerably. Um, and what we're seeing most notable is the prevalence of vehicles stolen while running and unattended. Um, it, what we kind of see that typically is a common trend in the colder months, um, but we're seeing it kind of consistently or even escalating. Um, and most of the victims, you know, their story is that they ran into a store or, or for a short time or it's um, delivery drivers making deliveries and leaving their uh, cars running even for a, a few minutes unattended and they come back and it's no longer there. Uh, and like I had just said, the bottom point there is like typically we kind of see that um, a decrease in that kind of um, activity of people leaving their cars running and they end up being stolen. So. Um, kind of concerning. Uh, we have a slide coming up in our kind of action plan that kind of addresses um, what we're trying to do in messaging uh, regarding auto thefts. Next slide, please. All right, and I'm going to turn it over to Commander Case to kind of touch on some of those action plans that we're working on. Okay, can you go ahead and flip to the next slide, please? So I want to touch on what we're doing as far as gun violence goes. Um, you've heard me speak before on our focus enforcement detail, details, and for those of you who don't know, it's really a <clears throat> collaboration between multiple law enforcement agencies and our, our, probation, our probation partners, uh, where we use evidence-based and, and intelligence to point us in the right direction of where we want to be um, spending our time with resources. So since our last meeting, we've uh, conducted four focus enforcement details. Those has recovered uh, 16 guns and we've made 39 arrests. Those arrests have ranged um, in the spectrum from carjacking suspects, uh, homicide suspects, people involved with weapons violations and, and uh, narcotics violations. And uh, some of the other things that we're doing is we started sharing uh, mapping uh, data with the Office of Violence Prevention to help them uh, coordinate their resource deployment for their uh, violence interrupters. Go ahead to the next slide. And this is what Scott was uh, referring to here as far as messaging. We've spoken before about we've used our uh, CPS staff to try to message out to residents on different platforms to be more aware of uh, keeping their items locked or remove items from their vehicles. So <clears throat> this is a, an initiative with the state that we partnered with. Just again, it's a public uh, safety announcement as a way to um, make people more aware of, of the issue and to be uh, diligent about removing items or locking their, their vehicles and not leaving them running. <clears throat> uh, next. 
So before we go on, is there any questions, uh, Chair, that you have on the, the statistical analysis or from any of the other uh, council members? <coughs> I I don't have any questions. Thank you for this information. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? I'm not seeing any. Uh, appreciate very much so the uh, information on the target and enforcement. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, again, this information has been very helpful. So uh, continuing forward. Thank you. All right, so if you could just start with the next slide. So um, I'm going to turn this over to Lindsay Larson, and she's really the analyst who has been digging into this. And just to set the stage for conversation, um, as I've mentioned before, it's, it's the data sets very complex to try to pull apart. Um, and just because of our records management system and all the different variables that surround this. So just trying to set some expectations for the conversation during this presentation. This is very preliminary or initial. And so um, as you form questions, if you want to hold them to the end, if you can, it might be helpful because um, Lindsay might address your questions um, throughout the presentation. There's about five or six slides and there's a lot of information here and it's just really the tip of the iceberg of what we're finding as far as trying to understand the dynamics and the variables around use of force and and really what we're trying to do as an agency is represent this visually in the most um you know efficient manner than the, the, the easiest platform for people to understand given the complexity of all the variables uh associated with force so um with that i'm going to go ahead and turn it over to lindsay and she can uh, go ahead and start her her presentation Welcome. Thank you. Um, so just to get us started, uh, I want to let you know I've spent a ton of time digging into the data. Um, I'm going to share what I have, what I've learned so far, but trust me, like Commander Kay said, there is a ton more to explore, and this is really just the beginning. Um, I expect I'll have a lot to share over the next few meetings with you. Um, just before I show you the numbers, I want to provide some important context. Uh, the MPD has dramatically changed how it records force. force. Um, so I want to walk you through some of these changes at a high level. Um, to start the timeline, definitions changed around September 2020. That's when we started um, looking at force differently and recording more of it. Uh, the software updates and officer training then happened between October and December. And in my charts, I'll show you that. Um, that time frame. The requirements that changed, uh, one of the really big ones was we started tracking handcuffing and escort holds. So that was not captured previously. And if you think about arrests, you're often handcuffing and escort holding someone. Um, so th that is very common. So you're going to see a large increase of those situations. Um, in addition, we added more selections um, to reflect sort of the level of specificity of the force. So for example, previously we tracked handgun uh, and now we're tracking a more specific handgun unholstered or handgun pointed, or did you do both? Um, that can be captured as well. So with all these changes going on, uh, the definitions changing in September, but actually software updates not happening till later in the year. Um, officers were sort of left to their own devices and, and data tracking wasn't necessarily available to them. Uh, for example, handcuffing and escort holds was not something they could select uh, in that period of time. Um, it's only been like this year that that's been available. So they're, they're trying to record this. They're trying to um, fulfill their obligation to report that force was used now that the way we define force. So what I'm getting at is they captured multiple types of things. They they interpreted this um, and erred on the side of caution. Uh, I was reviewing examples um, and found situations where an officer mentioned um, that they encountered someone who was having a medical issue and they turned them on their side and then took their pulse on their neck and then realized they should take it on their wrist. They filled out a force of uh, use of force form for that action. Um, similarly, I saw situations where EMS assistants helping someone to a gurney or stretcher, um, they filled out a force form. Uh, another case, 
uh, an officer encountered someone um, who they knew uh, that there was an issue and they wanted to have a conversation with that person um, to discuss resources. And it was February, it was cold. They wanted to just have that conversation in the car, um, show them some videos and go over a few things. Uh, so they they patted the person down for weapons and then just had a conversation in the car, finished the conversation and, and the guy went on his way. Um, that the officer filled out a use of force form. So these are the anomalies. I'm not saying this is happening all the time, but I just want to let you know all those situations, even though we might not traditionally think of them as force, um, they are captured in this data. A force form was filled out. I'm counting it. Um, so just kind of, I wanted to give you that sort of, give you the landscape of data entry and where it's at. All right, next slide. So now comes the fun part. How do we want to count force? Uh, in this presentation, I've got it counted two ways. Um, first is by incident, and this is counting unique, what, I'm, what we call case numbers. That means a, a crime happened, there was a police report that was filled out, so a form, a use of force form would have been done. Um, and I'm counting it very simply to start. It's a yes, no. Yes, force was used no force wasn't and it can include any type of force handcuffs taser firearm body uh, bodily force just if force was used on a person it is captured it is counted in my numbers right now um we will get to types of force but for right now we're just counting did this incident have force and then similarly with person um, i'm looking at unique persons per case per incident, per event, if you will. Um, so if uh, I had force used against me, I will count in the data for that case. Let's say in a month I commit a crime and I have force used against me again, I will count a second time in the data set. So it's per case that people are getting counted. Um, and again, it's for any type of force that is used handcuffs, uh, which is, is a lot of our force, all the way up to if even if a firearm was pointed at you. Um, as far as sort of data considerations go, just, just so you're aware, Park Police and U of M Police cases calls are not included in the data. And uh, as Commander Case was mentioning, this data is very complicated, it's messy, um, but I'm working really hard to get usable, informative numbers so that everyone has the information and understanding needed so you can make decisions. Next slide. Okay, sorry, this is my last descriptive one and then I will show you numbers. Um, my goal, as I was saying, is to count and include as much as I can. So I just wanna walk you through um, what I learned after digging into the data. There's a couple um, odd scenarios that I just want you to understand how I counted them. Um, so by incident, uh, there are two situations I encountered. One were blank force forms. So details were not entered in, but a force form was created. Uh, and then another situation is, when you have a case in our records management system, you put in an offense code. And so, for example, if there's a homicide, you would put murder is the code. Um, when force is used, officers are supposed to put force in there as one of the offense codes. I have encountered where force is a code, but there was no force form that was completed. In both these cases, I am counting those that force was used. That case is counted as a force used case. Um, now, talking about persons, uh, people, if they're only identified by their race, but they don't have a name, or if they're identified name, but without a race, those people are included. They're counted in the numbers, um, and you'll see that when I get to them. Uh, however, people with completely blank information, so no name, no race, no role regarding like who they were uh, in the case, those situations are not being counted. Um, now, when I looked at these, I did a review. I, I took a sample and tried to understand, okay, why, why am I seeing blank people? Like, what's, what's going on? Most of the time, I can say that the person does end up getting captured in another officer's uh, report. So most of the people are still counted in my numbers. They do get counted but there are situations where it was blank um, and, and that person was missed. There are also situations where there wasn't a person. So in reading through the police narrative, 
um, I encountered cases where officers, they unholstered a gun. So uh, an example would be like a domestic abuse uh, in progress call. Um, you know, perhaps they meet, um, let's say girlfriend uh, downstairs and she says, my boyfriend's upstairs, he has a gun. Um, the officer in some cases will unholster their gun, go up and clear that apartment, clear that house, check to see if anyone's in there. And so in the cases where maybe the boyfriend fled, he left and there was no person there, the officer has completed a use of force form um, saying that their weapon wasn't holstered, but it wasn't directed at anyone. So that's why that is blank. Um, this happened, um, I, I encountered this a couple times. Um, so that's one situation. However, to go back to when people are genuinely missing and, and should have been included, um, we're looking into that. We think it might be a timing issue when the officer fills out the report and when person information is added into the case. Um, so we're gonna investigate that because if it is a timing issue within the system, maybe there's training or ways we can circumvent that. Um, I have to understand more of the process of when officers are completing stuff. So we're gonna look into that. Another solution that I'm gonna implement is sort of an audit function looking back at cases where stuff is missing and you know addressing that is that stuff supposed to be missing or was that just uh you know they missed it um so we're going to be implementing that um i'm going to do sort of an automated audit uh in the next two weeks here all right on to the numbers next slide so let me kind of walk through this with you. This is an overview that I want to provide helpful context as we're looking at use of force. Um, I sort of pulled out what I'd consider to be sort of other health metrics to showcase what's going on at the same time as use of force. Um, so I'll walk you through it. To start, if you look at the bottom, this data is looking is going from January 2020 to uh, July of this year, 2021. You can see those big bars running vertically. The blue bar is that September definition change. And then that green bar is when the system updates were occurring and training was happening with the officers. So just keep that in mind um, as I walk through these different line charts uh, that that's going on in those periods. Okay. The top line chart, that black line, that looks at MPD calls for service. So one thing I want to know is, is have our calls changed? Is there any sort of volume difference there? Um, overall, you can see not really. It's roughly been the same over that time period. I mean, you have a couple spikes, a couple dips, but you're looking at roughly 22, 20,000 calls a month for the MPD. Um, another question I ask myself is, so when we're thinking of use of force, have we seen um, community reaction change? Have we seen complaints, more complaints? Um, now this data here in the green line are all OPCR complaints received. I pulled this from their public facing dashboard. Um, so I have to say it's not just MPD uh, complaints. I'll see if I can get that for, for next time maybe, um, but it was sort of a, uh, metric that I could look at and say, okay, did we see any fluctuation? Did we see on all complaints received? So I'm not talking about duplicates or anything, just everything that came in. Um, did we see anything there? And aside from the, the spike, you can see, no, roughly it's been same, maybe even a little bit of a dip at the beginning of the year. Um, but again, that's aside from that big spike, um, relatively steady. The next line is that light gray line. That's looking at all cases, or you could consider it police reports or crimes. This is where a narrative has been written, a police report has been created um, out of the calls for service. Uh, and this is, so you can see, again, it's been relatively steady, maybe a slight decline. We're at roughly 3,800 a month right now. Um, and I'll pause for a second case, are there questions? Looks like Councilmember Gordon has jumped in the queue. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for all this information. It's, of course, a lot to take in. I just wanted to ask a question for clarity and also for the, the public, because you referenced uh, that the um, OPCR, these are all complaints received, um, and then you implied it wasn't just for Minneapolis police. Could you just maybe elaborate on what other complaints might have come in that weren't Minneapolis police officers involved?
and I don't need a number on those, but just to help us understand. Hi, Council Member Gordon, it's Commander Case. So I'll uh, I'll touch on that. So when the OPCR receives complaints, there's sometimes there will be for different jurisdictions. So it could be for somebody from the park police or somebody from Metro Transit or a different policing agency. So those numbers can be pulled out, but um, their public facing dashboard doesn't delineate those. So these are all the, the, the complaints that they've uh, received and then through their um, administrative process when they review those they determine which ones are within the jurisdiction and in their purview and then if they're not they um, will forward those on to the appropriate jurisdiction. I appreciate that thank you and my understanding is usually the other jurisdictions aren't a majority of the complaints but they're a good piece of them and it varies depending on you know what was happening so glad to get the clarity for everybody thank you. And I know sometimes there were duplicates from what I could see that was available on the dashboard. Um, so yeah, I just tried to include everything um, to start, but we'll see if we can pull out the the right ones um, if that's if, uh, if that's helpful. Um, moving on to the uh, cases with use of force. So that's that dark gray line towards the bottom. Um, so this is counting all police cases where use of force happened. Again, it's that yes it occurred or no it didn't it could be handcuffing it could be firearm it could be um, bodily force taser etc um, so you can see early in 2020 we we're filling in or completing 50 to 80 give or take a month and then we changed the definition um, in september and that's where you can see a huge spike um, in in the number of reports uh, per in the number of cases um, and that spike continues to go up. Uh, I can tell you that in that 672 and the number below it, a lot of those are the handcuffing, the things that we were not recording before officers now entering that information. Um, and actually I'll explain later, but they entered because it wasn't available in the system yet. It was a blank form. Um, they wanted that force captured, but we didn't have a data field yet. So that's why there's this huge spike of um, sort of capturing everything and, and definitely erring on that side of caution. You can see um, as as training happens, as the system actually updates, that things start to normalize, I would say, um, and we're sustaining more of a level of 500-ish, 550 um, maybe on the high end of uh, cases that have force um, per month. So now let me break that down a little bit in the blue lines at the bottom. So the light blue line that's running along the bottom and sort of jumps up though those are handcuffing and escort hold only cases so no other force was used just someone was either it could be handcuffed and escort holded or just one or the other um, so that would definitely be a whole new group um, that hadn't been recorded before the dark blue line is all other force. So handcuffing can be in there, but some other type of force was also included. Um, so you can kind of see that spike in that 659, that 509, 568 there of the dark blue. This is before handcuffing was a field they could select. So that's where in those months, I actually see a lot of blank forms because officers were trying to complete it, but it wasn't available in the system. Again, now in January, those updates have gone through and training has occurred. And now I think there's a better understanding and the fields are there that they can complete the form correctly. Um, if you look like sort of for this year, 2021, you can see about half the cases are that handcuffing and escort hold only, and the other half would have some other force used in them. Um, I will explain that in, in next meeting, I will break down force types for us to look at. Um, this is just that binary of yes, there was force or no, there wasn't force. Um, and then the last thing I'll leave you with, I, I thought about this like after turning in the slides, of course, um, to give you perspective on how much is use of force out of our cases, out of our calls for service, so 
if you're looking at um, the dark blue line, let's say for 2021, that's about 8% of our cases. So 8% of our cases are um, using force other than just handcuffs and escort holds. If you combine the two, um, the, the light blue and the dark blue line, so what that dark gray line is above, if you add those together, um, you're looking at 15% uh, of cases if you combine it all. So looking at all use of force is 15% of our cases. And then if you take that and you look at um, calls for service, so all of our calls, you're looking at about 2.6% um, of the calls we take forces used. Now, I know that was a ton of information. Um, I'm, I'll pause for a sec, see if there are questions. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to move on and, and answer questions if they come to you as well. Great, thank you. We love a nerd, so thank you for the level of detail. This is great. Um, are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? All right, I'm not seeing any. Is there anything else to add for this? For me? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> yeah, let's keep going. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so that was interesting information to get a handle on of, OK, how many cases are we seeing per month? Another thought I had is, OK, well, what what are the situations where we're using force? Let's start to dig into that and, and understand when force is occurring. So I started off with looking at the most common MPD calls where force is used. Um, this top chart here is looking at the highest number of force cases, um, so the highest number of sort of incidents, and then that bottom chart is looking at the highest percentage, so saying of calls, how many calls had force used. So let me walk you through both. Um, if you look at the top one, you can see domestic abuse in progress is the top call for service that we get where force ends up being used. Um, 522 out of 3,000 calls, so you're looking at roughly 17% of domestic abuse in progress calls, some form of force is used. Um, and I can give you a little preview for maybe next time. Most of that is handcuffing. Most of that is escort holds. Um, after those two, bodily force tends to be the the next common um, force type that gets used. Um, and you can look sort of if you go down the uh, column there of the different types and then look at the percentage, it sort of shows you how most of the time force is not used in these situations. Um, the rest of them, it's less than 10%, in some cases less than 5% of cases force ends up being used. Again, most of the force for these cases tends to be that handcuffing and escort hold. That's all counted in here. Um, I will call out, though, that suspicious vehicle. That one tends to have more firearms used, and I can show that next time. Um, I was looking into, okay, why? Because um, I'm curious. Uh, for, from the quick review that I did, just to give you some idea, it tended to be stolen vehicles. Um, Okay, I'm going to move to that bottom chart now. Um, this is looking at highest percentage. So if we look at that chase on foot, there have been 41 calls, um, situations with chase on foot. 31 of them had some sort of force used. So that ends up being about 75%. Um, typical that force will happen. I, I think we can say that. Um, again, that one tended to be uh, handcuffing as well. Um, some of these, these ones tend to have more, I would say, firearms being used, um, but uh, mostly it's the handcuffing, it's the escort holds, but there are some where that's higher, I would say high risk warrant, more likely to see a firearm used. Um, So that's that data. Um, you can see, uh, I, I will just point out, you know, the volumes here are relatively low. Like if you're looking at that top table, 3,000 domestic abuse and progress calls versus these other ones are more in the 40, 100 um, range. We do get some more with, with shootings and stabbings, um, but the volume is still low. And you can see, particularly on that bottom chart, like, yes, those top calls there, the percentage is high, but it does kind of quickly drop off to more that 24, 22, 22, 20% 20 um, of the calls. So 
overall, especially when you look at that top chart, for the use of force on these calls is not the norm. Um, you can see by those percentages, it tends to be very low. Um, and when force is used, it does tend to be the handcuffing and escort hold. So that I will explain more next time. I'll get into the details of the types of force use so we can review that. But um, this sort of gives you, OK, when is force happening? This was sort of a, a start, a review of that. All right, and then the next one. OK, this is a, a look here at race and ethnicity. Uh, so let me walk you through this table. In the left table here, you'll see that race is along the rows and ethnicity is in the columns. Um, if we, and you can see, yeah, hopefully you can see non-Hispanic, Hispanic, East African origin, unknown and blank, that's the ethnicity, and then um, black, white, American, Indian, Alaska, Native, Asian, uh, Hawaiian, other Pacific Islander, those are the race um, fields. If we go across, let's start with race, and we look at black, the proportion of persons who are black who have force used upon them is 58.5%. White is 22.7%. Um, American Indian, Alaska Native, 8.5%. Asian is 1.2%. And Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander um, is 0.1%. Unknown is 6.7% or 363 persons. Um, what I was able to find in the data is if we look at ethnicity along unknown race, we do actually get some more information. And you can see non-Hispanic, Hispanic or Latino, and East African origin under that unknown race row have values. So it's quite possible that Maybe officers were uncomfortable with selecting the race, but felt more comfortable selecting ethnicity. Um, I mean, you can also look at we have 3,100 um, black persons captured. We have 1,200 white persons. We have 363 unknown. And if I take out the Hispanic um, and the East African, it's it's an even smaller number. Um, I don't think things are trying to be hidden or obfuscated with this data. Um, I do want us to get better at tracking unknown and blanks. I think there's the potential to improve those numbers, particularly the blanks. Um, I'm not sure why that why they're blank, um, and that's probably something we can improve. Um, I will say that other analyses that have been done that have used this data they don't have the ethnicity field right now in our open data. That's something as I'm doing all this work, I'm preparing data sets, I, we will publish new data and I would really like ethnicity to be available, um, assuming that's okay with the city. I, I think that's a very important metric that people have access to. Um, and then regarding other thought, it's quite possible other analyses have had def different methodologies in terms of how they counted stuff. I definitely am putting together lots of different data sets and tables that I have access to to try to get the best picture possible for us. Um, so that could be playing into it too. Um, the one other thing I'll, I'll mention is I incorporated this arrestees table as uh, I thought it might be an important reference point. Um, it mimics the proportion of race uh, with the use of force reports data. You can see black is very similar at that um, almost 60%, white more in that 25% range, um, American and Alaskan Native is about 10%, Asian about 1% to 2%, um, unknown again at 6%. Uh, if, if those were very different, um, I would have a lot of questions around that, but knowing that when we arrest someone, we are now counting that as force, handcuffs, escort holds, that is force. Um, this starts to, this aligns, I would say. Uh, next slide. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Don't worry. Don't Gordon. Could you just remind us the time period for these Absolutely. numbers? Is this all this, this year up, up until today? Correct. Yeah, this is this year. Uh, I think technically it would be through yesterday <laughs> or Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. OK, so out of the 2,757 people arrested this year, 56.9% um, of them were identified as black. Yes. OK, 
Do you think that's typical for, well, we probably can't, I can't expect you to compare it to other years because you wouldn't be willing to if the data wasn't right in front of you probably, but I'd be curious about if this has changed at all um, over the years. It also is, it's, I think, pretty clear that um, this is out of sync with uh, the population percentages in our city, so there seems to be some disparate this, you know, I don't know what spirit numbers. Thank you. All right, I'll, uh, my last slide here is just sort of letting you know what's coming. Um, so I mentioned the next time I want to report details regarding types of force that are used. Um, I also want to let you know and give a great shout out to IT. They have been invaluable partners with this. Um, as we're looking at data together, I'm looking at the front end, I'm looking at the data set, and when they don't match, I'm working with IT to solve for that. Um, they've been wonderful and are helping to continue to build out this data. Um, I'm also working on building a new dashboard so we can have this data out and available. And then, as I mentioned, uh, publishing new data sets to open data so people have access to it. All right, I will let you <laughs> do questions. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Uh, Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Cunningham, and thank you for this uh, report. This is helpful and it answers a lot of the questions that we raised in, in the last couple of meetings. So I really uh, appreciate you digging into this and I was getting ready to ask you a question about coming back to us with report details for types of force and you've already got it on the slide there. So that means we're very much on the same page and. Uh, on the right track about what information will help inform the public. Obviously, there's a the confusion that's created because we started tracking more, uh, where it looks like there's a lot more use of force happening. And the challenge of that is we have an explanation for why that number went up. Uh, but until we get that next report, we're not going to know whether the use of force that people are most concerned about went up or down during that period because it's kind of hidden in some other data. And so I, I think that uh, getting to the detail about types of force so that we can we can track some of that uh, over time and and understand which way things are trending uh, and the ways we're using force is going to be really important and uh, I really uh, appreciate uh, the presentation here so thank you and uh, uh, looking forward to seeing you come back with uh, the type of force. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments related to this? portion of the presentation. Right, I'm not seeing any. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Great information um, and great work. So thank you for all that you do. And I believe that should be the end of the community safety update, if I am correct. Is that right, Commander? Uh, yes, you are correct, Chair, sir, for the delay. We have a process we have to go through with clicking microphones and speakers off so we don't have weird echo. So yes, <laughs> we are all done. Great, no worries. Really great presentation uh, per usual. Great data. Uh, thank you to you and your team for this information. Uh, it's definitely very informative for us as policymakers as well as the public. So thank you very much. And I'll just pause one last time to see if there are any other questions or comments from my colleagues. All right, I'm not seeing any. Thanks team, much appreciated. Thank you. All right, moving on to our last item. Today is our discussion item uh, re regarding receiving and filing an update on the project plan surrounding community safety led by Dr. Antonio Oft Lee. I'm sorry, I know I just said your name wrong. Um, so this is uh, the an overview of the community safety project um, and I will give a brief little bio here um, because we don't have staff to be able to do an introduction today. So, um, so what we have here is that our presenter um, is here to present an overview of the pro bono community safety project that he is leading with the team at Leadership for a Networked World at Harvard University. This project was authorized by council at his regular meeting on March 26, 2021. 
Uh, he is a Minneapolis native, born and raised on the south side of Minneapolis. He is now the executive director of Leader, Leadership for a Network World, a center at Univer Harvard University that helps to create leaders, or excuse me, helps creators, leaders create exceptional environments for organizational in innovation. In addition, Antonio is a past commissioner on the Commission on the Future of Policing in Ireland, a current board member of Lutheran Services in America, and the current US Federal Monitor for the Consent Decree overseeing the Seattle Police Department. And uh, through all of this, he remains a steadfast Vikings fan. So with that, I shall pass uh, the presentation over. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here, Antonio. Thank you, Chairperson Cunningham, and uh, thank you for uh, having me uh, join uh, fellow council members. Um, wanted to get, give you a walkthrough of the project that is um, in flight uh, right now. Uh, we're currently working on this. Uh, and also give you a bit of a respite from being in the weeds on the data. This will kind of get up on the balcony a little bit to look more at um, the future of, of um, safe and thriving communities and what that may mean for uh, for activities going forward. So um, I'll give a, just a broad overview on this. So really the, the, the thrust of this work um, is around answering questions for the city. Um, we're at a point, as all of us know, where we're uh, looking at what the future can be for community safety, uh, making sure that the community feels safe and thriving, um, and what the services and capabilities may need to be in the future in order to make that happen. So we're really trying to answer the que some questions around what could five years look like, what could 10 years out even look like if Minneapolis started to build towards that future next year. Um, so what, what would be the, in many ways the art uh, of the possible? Um, we all know what some of the big challenges are, and on that very first slide, um, it kind of lays that out. Uh, one of the initial findings that we've had in having a lot of discussions and research calls across the city is that everything, not everything, but there's there's a lot of uh, work happening in silos. A lot of this work is great. Uh, a number of initiatives that are really moving the needle or trying to make progress on, on these vital community initiatives, but oftentimes they're, they're run uh, without a lot of coordination, a lot of collaboration across those entities. So policing and public health and human services and mental health services, et cetera, uh, across programs, across uh, jurisdictions are oftentimes siloed. So the future on the next slide, uh, and, and again, these are very broad strokes that we're talking about here, but the future, most of us all know, as I've talked with many of you, uh, the council members here on the line, is gonna be much more driven by what I would call an ecosystem-based approach, where we say, what does safe and healthy and thriving communities look like? And what are the services in a continuum that can that can build that up over time? So looking at across upstream type human services, uh, downstream policing services, in all these areas in the middle where we can get real time response um, and action to solve community problems. Oftentimes, uh, solve the root cause of problems as well, the more we move upstream. So a big focus of this work is looking at not only what is Minneapolis doing now, uh, what capabilities does the city have around this continuum of services, um, as well as what, what capabilities and services and programs are needed in order to build out that continuum more holistically. So if you envision maybe on, on, a, on a left side of a continuum, you have all these prevention oriented activities that the city can do, violence prevention and, and youth programs and uh, programs around housing assistance and you know, all these core things driven by social determinants of health that lead to healthier and safer communities. As you move kind of to the right on that continuum, you start to get into these areas where there can be joint multidisciplinary co-response to a number of range of ranges of issues uh, in a city. You may have an incident that needs, uh, you know, 80% human services type uh, capabilities and 20% sworn officers. As you move over in that other side of the continuum, might, you might have an incident that needs 80% uh, sworn officers and 20% you know, mental health or human services type capabilities along with that call. And as you move all the way to the other end of the spectrum, there's also other prevention oriented activities more around healing and trauma response, 
uh, and making sure that we can learn from community incidents in order to inform that overall continuum. So the that main the main thrust of a lot of this work will be looking at the continuum of services and what it means to uh, to build up safe and thriving communities. Um, if you go to the next slide. Uh, practically, what we'll be doing and we're currently doing right now is looking at what capabilities does, does Minneapolis currently have? Uh, what ca capabilities do we need along that continuum of services? And, uh, and what do we build? And build meaning should these services be community based that the city collaborates with um, and perhaps funds or should they be city based services or some type of a hybrid? So this what do we have? What do we need and what do we build? will be um, will be critical to this overall continuum of, of services. Um, so that's probably the most important piece, but underneath that will be on the next slide um, you can go to is uh, a report of where we're at on this. So we, it says violence prevention services, but, that, but I actually look at that a little bit more holistically in that uh, it's prevention services, social determinants of health driven services that that can get to the root cause of challenges um, uh, in the community. So we'll have an inventory, as I mentioned, of this work, um, and then we'll uh, we'll look at what what could take place across jurisdictions, across boundaries, across agencies, in order to build that um, that cohesive uh, uh, ecosystem out um, and integrate those services. Supporting that, if you go to the next slide. Uh, will be some work around uh, transforming 911. So uh, 911, you could also say 988, which should be part of that as well. So this is really vitally important because if we have this continuum of services in the future that can respond to all these, these varieties of community needs, we want that response to be real time, to be dynamic, meaning that it, it can, it can shape shift, you can mix and match services uh, on demand. We need 911 and the 988 service to be able to triage that in real time and to be able to, to, to pick and choose services and be able to deploy those uh, in a connected way. So we'll be looking at how 911 along with CAD and RMS systems can, can integrate that more fully. So if you have, um, and this will answer a lot of questions, I, I should say that going back to the core of this as well, that we don't necessarily have the answer to yet, right? So if we had, for example, uh, in 80% human services, mental health, for example, response and 20% police, and they were integrated in a computer aided dispatch and records management system, um, should, for example, uh, well, how many human services type people should the city have in their capability mix? Right now, we don't know that exact number. Um, how should they be trained? Um, if we have them out in the field and they're 24-7, 365, um, what would that look like from an infrastructure perspective? Uh, things as granular as should uh, a mental health person or a human services person going out in the field with uh, co-responding officers, should that uh, person have a body camera? Um, what types of data should they collect to go into RMS so that things like we've been tracking with MPD around uh, force, uh, for example, um, and incidents can be measured and be transparent and we can look at that from many lenses. So the number of different questions around how we integrate all this work and how 911 can be the backbone of that and computer aided dispatch and records management can also bring the transparency and the measures that we need as well. Uh, for that continuum. So that'll be a big piece of this work, the transforming uh, 911. If you go to the next slide, um, we'll also have uh, looking directly at what this means for cross-boundary collaboration. This is where it'll, it, it'll more directly uh, look at Minneapolis Police Department in the context of what policies, practices, structures, systems, um, uh, processes would MPD maybe need to augment or change going forward in order to integrate more holistically um, uh, with the other services in that continuum? So uh, leaning a bit more into uh, what it would take to actually drive this type of collaboration and how we may need to augment uh, MPD going forward um, with that. And on the next slide, um, simply the, you know, we want to weave all of those three elements together, that continuum, the 911 transformation, and how we work across the agency boundaries into one comprehensive framework um, that can say, here's how, again, if we wanted to start transforming in a large way the city in more of a five year, six, seven year view, here's what 
that could potentially look like. Here's a lot of the major questions, uh, hopefully a lot of answers as to how that how that plays out, uh, what the investment for the city would need to look like, um, what some of the big change pieces would look like um, going forward. And we have a pretty robust team uh, on, the, on the last slide working on this. Uh, we have uh, uh, Uma Olawalia, who is uh, uh, part of Health Management Associates. Uma who has been a national, nationwide leader in human services, ran Montgomery County, Maryland's human services organization, uh, was also in Washington State running the human services. Uh, Brian Maxey, who uh, was the architect of uh, Seattle's uh, data and analytics, which is now viewed as probably one of the best uh, in the country. Um, and a lot of their co-response design he worked on. Uh, Rebecca Neustetter in the University of Chicago uh, that is spearheading a 911 uh, transformation initiative nationwide. But we'll be looking directly at Minneapolis. Uh, and then of course me, uh, will be uh, leading, leading the team going forward. Um, so I'll stop there and we can probably take the presentation down. I know we probably, I think we only have one minute left of, <laughs> of your time, I think here today. So um, more than happy to take some questions uh, or answer, answer anything you may need uh, in the remaining minute or so, or however long uh, Chairperson Cunningham gives us. Oh yeah, I appreciate your uh, thoughtfulness around the the timing. We do go as long as we need, so uh, so no worries there. So no rush. Um, this is a, a really important um, bit of information. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Cunningham, and thank you for this presentation and for your work. Uh, I'm excited about this. I, you know, you heard us have some discussion about coordination of research uh, even earlier in this meeting, and it's uh, it's a topic that's pretty live for us. So getting us getting a an inventory of what we have and and uh, all the different things that are, uh, as you said, sort of in flight uh, in in a lot of different areas is really helpful. Uh, I guess I want to make sure that you're getting uh, access, that we're not duplicating efforts as we get into this work. So, for example, the 911 work group is something that I've uh, you know cared a lot about and and uh, seen a lot of really good work happening there. Uh, as you bring in folks who are looking at 911 from other places and and thinking through some of the same questions and issues, uh, want to make sure that we're getting everybody full access to the work that's already been done and uh, making sure that we're we're moving together uh, rather than uh, duplicating efforts. So how this is this is our chance to check in a little bit to make sure that we're getting you what we would hope we would be getting you. Uh, so can you just fill us in a little bit about how the collaboration is going between the existing efforts and how much you're building on work that uh, we've already generated? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, um, uh, we, we're, I think, we're doing well in this regard, and of course, we'll reach out uh, for help if if we need someone. That we, uh, the city coordinator's office has been quite helpful. Um, uh, Mark, uh, before he left, of course, was was helping substantially on this, and Heather Johnson, we just met in person last week, and is helping coordinate a lot of that uh, activity. Um, and we've been pretty. Uh, it's been it's wor working well so far. Talking to a lot of different groups, we've been talking to the park board and the, the school system. Um, the Office of Violence Prevention obviously has been very integrated into our work so far um, in various other city functions. So, so far, uh, good uh, on the collaboration piece. Um, as we get, we haven't gone very deep yet into 911. Um, we'll be starting that likely uh, in about a, about 10 days or so, doing some, um, we've had one round of discussions with nine, not the leadership of 911, uh, but we'll be going deeper into that. So would uh, very much welcome uh, the collaboration on that and, and any help we can get from you. Great, right, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Right, I'm not seeing any. Uh, very excited about this work. Um, I'm somebody who appreciates the getting into the deep into the weeds, but also really loves systems work. And so um, really appreciate the framing around building out the ecosystem and, and being really thoughtful about that. Um, I think that this is a really great example of the kind of research that we really need right now um, as we are in a time of questions about what should our what should our systems look like and how should they operate and so i'm very excited about this work um, and look forward to being of support as you work for, as you move forward through it so thank you very much for being here today and i look forward to future conversations as well thank you thank you all thank you all right with that 
Uh, we have conducted, completed all of the business for our committee today. And uh, thank you again to all of the city staff for all that you do. Um, we are better off because of your service. Um, and thank you to the public for being plugged in and watch uh, the business of the city. So with that, thank you everyone. And I hope that you have a great rest of your day.